Yes, well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me uh, to speak. Um, I am have fond memories of Heathrop, of, obviously, and um, I used to teach uh, Wittgenstein, uh, um, an undergraduate course from Wittgenstein, um, and I became very interested in um, also in philosophy of religion, and I ended up um, thinking quite a lot about what Wittgenstein had to say about religious belief and so what I'm going to give you should really function as a sort of an introduction to Wittgenstein on religious belief but he's actually going to go into quite a lot of uh, detail um, as we go along but hopefully um, you'll be able to follow it I've got plenty of slides to amuse you as we go along so can we let's let's see if we can see the first slide so um Religious belief, as I point out here, faces various uh, intellectual challenges, some more serious than others. Uh, recently, comparatively recently, Richard Dawkins, of course, has entered the fray with his book, uh, The God Delusion. And he maintains, rightly or wrongly, that, that science constitutes a threat to uh, religious belief. Um, Others disagree. Others think that science uh, can't really adjudicate on religious matters. Um, that this is a sort of fundamental confusion. Um, and qu quite often you hear Wittgenstein mentioned in these kind of debates. You find that Wittgenstein's views on religious belief are invoked to, sh to show that actually someone like Richard Dawkins is not in any position as a scientist to criticize or refute uh, religious belief. So what I'm going to do, as I've already said, is uh, explain what Wittgenstein has to say, or rather I'm going to set out some different interpretations of Wittgenstein because he's pretty cryptic, quite difficult to figure out what he means to be honest, there are differing interpretations, and I'm going to give you three leading interpretations of Wittgenstein. So let's have the next slide. Here is Wittgenstein, uh, quoted, Lectures and Conversations, page 55. He says, if you ask me whether or not I believe in a judgment day in the sense in which a religious, religious people have belief in it, I wouldn't say, no, I don't believe there will be such a thing it would seem to me utterly crazy to say this. And then I give the explanation, I don't believe in, but then the religious person never, never, person never believes what I describe. I can't say, I can't contradict that person. So there seems to, this is a little bit opaque, but the suggestion seems to be that, um, that that what the religious person signs up to is something that the critic can't quite comprehend, let alone uh, refute or out a serious objection to. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Here are two claims which possibly Wittgenstein is putting forward here. So the first one I'm going to call no contradiction. So when atheists um, deny the beliefs they take to be expressed by such sentences as God exists or God created the world or Jesus rose from the dead or we will face a judgment day, they fail to contradict the religious beliefs that such sentences are used to express. So someone like Dawkins uh, cannot contradict what religious people express using these sentences. Um, and the second claim is immunity. Even if an atheist was successfully to refute the belief they took such a sentence to express by providing empirical evidence to the contrary, say, they would fail thereby to refute the religious belief expressed. So when Richard Dawkins goes after religious beliefs, he ends up attacking something other than what the religious person is actually committed to, he's misunderstood, he's missed the target. Uh, the religious belief is immune to his kind of attack. So those are the two claims that I think you might plausibly attribute to Wittgenstein in that preceding paragraph that we looked at. Let's go to the next slide. 
Wittgenstein suggests that the way in which religious language is used differs from the way scientific language is used. Um, this is a very familiar Wittgensteinian idea, it crops up again and again and again in his later philosophy. Philosophical puzzles are generated by our failure to attend carefully to how language is being used, and in particular, to subtle differences in the way language is being used. And exactly that point is being made here. So God exists and electrons exist, appear superficially very similar. But according to Wittgenstein, their use is very different. And Wittgenstein has, he offers as a slogan somewhat hesitantly, but he suggests something like this may be correct, that meaning is use. So obviously, if these sentences are used in different ways, then they're going to have different meanings. Well, so far, so good. But I mean, how exactly is religious language uh, used? And why should we suppose that no contradiction and immunity, those two claims we just looked at, why should we suppose that they follow, given this difference in use? So next slide. As I mentioned earlier, Wittgenstein's writing is quite opaque. Um, I don't claim to know what Wittgenstein's view is, actually. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at three leading interpretations of Wittgenstein. Um, and then I'm going to argue that none of them provide a plausible account on which no contradiction and immunity follow. So I'm going to be quite critical of sort of this Wittgensteinian approach. Uh, next slide. So these are the labels that I'm introducing. Um, actually, non-cognitivism is not my label. That's been knocking around for a long time. So the first, the first interpretation is that um, religious language is used in, in a sort of non-cognitivist way. Uh, the second view I call the juicer view, uh, which I associate with people like John Cottingham will explain. And then the third view I call the atheist minus view. So these are these are the labels that I'm going to use for these three different views. And I'm going to go through them uh, one at a time. Three different interpretations of Wittgenstein on how religious language is used. So let's go to the next slide. Non-cognitivist accounts of how religious language are used. So Hans-Johan Glock interprets Wittgenstein this way, if you want to have an, a name to hang this particular view on, this interpretation on, hans Jönhan Glock. Uh, according to Glock, sentences like God exists and Jesus rose from the dead are not used to make claims at all. Uh, no claim is made by those who utter these sentences. They're using the words in, a, in some other way not to make claims. Um, and of course, if no claim is made, well, then there's nothing there to refute. You can't refute uh, a you know, <clears throat> what's, what's uttered if what's uttered is not a claim. Um, there's, there's nothing there to rebut. So how might um, these sentences be used if they're not being used to make claims? Well, one suggestion would be to express some sort of attitude or emotion um, so, for example, uh, it's a bit of a caricature, but the idea would be that when people say God exists, they are in effect sort of going, oh, wow, to the fact that the universe exists. They're expressing their feelings, they're emoting rather than um, making a claim. If you um, have a little background knowledge in philosophy, this, this, this might well sound quite familiar because you find this kind of view elsewhere. Um, uh, there's a theory called the boo hooray theory in ethics, which says that when somebody says that something is morally wrong, killing is wrong, actually, according to A.J. Ayer, what you're really doing there is you're not making a claim, but you're going boo to killing. You're expressing an emotion. And similarly, when you say repaying your debts is good, you're going hooray to paying, repaying your debts. Now, boo and hooray, we're not dealing with assertions here. If you go boo to Arsenal or hooray 
to Manchester United, you're not you're not making claims at all. You're just emoting. You're just expressing how you feel. You're not even making a claim about yourself. You're expressing how you feel rather than making some sort of autobiographical claim. And uh, so Aya thinks that moral utterances don't make claims at all. They're used to express attitudes. And exactly the same suggestion is made here. Um, when people say God exists and Jesus rose from the dead, they're not making claims at all. They're expressing perhaps some sort of attitude, some sort of emotion. Um, and if no claim is made, then no claim can be refuted. So religious utterances are going to be off limits to scientific uh, refutation. So that's a non-cognitivist account of how religious language is used. And some people interpret Wittgenstein this way as signing up to a sort of non-cognitivist account of how religious language is used. So let's go to the next slide. So is a fairly bog standard criticism of a non-cognitivist understanding of how religious language is used. Um, the vast majority of uh, religious people um, don't seem to be <laughs> using religious language uh, merely to express how they feel about things. Um, it really matters to many Christians, for example, that as a matter of historical fact, Jesus rose from the dead. Um, and um, they believe that God exists makes a claim, a claim which could potentially be threatened by something like, say, the problem of evil. Surely we've got evidence against the existence of God there. Uh, the atheist might say. Now, it's hard to see um, how there could be any problem of evil or uh, I I if no claim is actually made by those saying God, um, saying God exists. Um, certainly that the resurrection actually historically happened is very important to many Christians. And if that's true, then clearly it's a claim. It's a historical claim. They understand it as that non-cognitivism cannot be an accurate account of how they're using religious language. So this is the first um, sort of fairly bog standard um, criticism of non-cognitivist readings of religious language. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. So that brings me to the second interpretation of Wittgenstein. Um, and I call these juicer views. And the reason that I call these juicer views is because John Cottingham, who I quote here, um, uses this juicer analogy to try and articulate the view, or what I take the view to be. So he says, analytic philosophers are often prone to use the fruit juicer method when approaching modes of thought of which they are sceptical they require the clear liquid of a few propositions to be extracted for examination in isolation from what they take to be the irrelevant pulpy mush of context. Someone who has only tasted strawberries by the output of the juicer and has firmly decided this is not for me may turn out to have a radically impoverished grasp of what it is about the fruit that makes the strawberry lover so enthusiastic. So the analogy was obviously, if we, if we unpack it, the suggestion is that um, the atheist tries to extract from religious utterances uh, a sort of a, the juice of certain claims and then subjects those claims to uh, critical scrutiny. But in fact, they're missing out on a great deal of other stuff. Um, and it's, it's, it's only when you look at the whole package that you can begin to comprehend, can begin to understand what's so attractive about uh, religious belief, why religious belief might be something that uh, you want to sign up to. So that's uh, one uh, version of the juice of you, which um, I take it John Cottingham is putting forward. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so this is not non-cognitivism notice. Uh, John Cottingham is clear that religious beliefs are beliefs. There are claims in there, there are propositions in there that 
However, the real meaning and significance of these claims, God exists and Jesus rose from the dead, is lost on atheist, sorry, atheist critics who extract only a thin juice um, from such utterances. They're missing out on far deeper and richer layers of significance um, and focusing only on this pure e extract. <laughs> which is deeply misleading. Um, that's a kind of standard use for argument. Um, let's go to the next slide. So the idea here is that the religious meaning extends beyond what the atheist critic grasps. Um, and for that reason, then, you might think that atheists cannot contradict what the religious person believes because they haven't fully comprehended it. And atheist attempts at refutation um, must be off target. So call this the juicer argument. Um, let's move to the next slide. I'm not persuaded that uh, the juicer argument works in terms of delivering immunity and no contradiction. So here is my um, counterexample. Suppose that John says Otto is a kraut, kraut being a rather rude way to refer to a German person. However, insult blind Mary misses out on that insulting dimension to the use of this particular word kraut. Um, so far as she's concerned, it just, it's just another word for German. Right? The, uh, the, the rather toxic overtones, she's missed out on all of that. <clears throat> so she says, no, you're mistaken. Otto is not a, a kraut, he's not German because she knows he's not German, right? Now, Mary surely has contradicted and perhaps refuted John. She doesn't need to be aware of the rich further levels of significance attached to the word kraut. It doesn't matter that she's missing out on that. She is missing out on it, doesn't matter. She can contradict uh, John um, and she can refute him uh, pretty conclusively. <laughs> by pointing out he's not even a German. Um, so similarly then, an atheist does not need to be aware of the rich further layers of significance to God exists and Jesus rose from the dead in order to contradict and refute the claims made by religious folk using such sentences, I mean, even if the juicer account is correct. The uh, immunity um, and the no contradiction conclusion, this they just don't follow. So the due to argument fails, even if there are layers of meaning beyond those accessible to the atheist, it doesn't follow that the atheist cannot contradict and indeed refute uh, the Christian. So um, that is my counterexample to the conclusions that you might draw from what John Cottingham has to say about how religious language is used. I'm not saying he draws those conclusions, by the way. Um, uh, we'll put that to one side. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, here's a slightly different juice of view. Um, um, it's, you can see from the diagram that it's a different view. Now the atheist meaning is not inside the religious meaning, it's been moved outside. Uh, the suggestion here is that there's no overlap at all between the claim made on the atheist's understanding of the religious sentence and the claim actually made by a religious person using that sentence. There's no overlap whatsoever, unlike on, on the previous weak juice of view, if you like. Um, now, an illustration of that would be if the religious language is being used metaphorically. Um, and I, I, if I remember correctly, on the next slide, I've got an example of that. So let's go. Let's go to the next slide and have a look. So, oh yeah, we do, thank goodness, right. So suppose Mary hears Romeo say, Juliet is the sun, a famous Shakespearean line. Uh, and Mary responds, but Juliet is obviously not the sun. She's not a massive hot object about which the earth rotates. Uh, here, it's clear that Mary has failed to contradict and refute what Romeo means when he says Juliet is the sun. She's got completely <laughs> the wrong end of the stick. She's 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 gone for a literal 
understanding when in fact this was a metaphor. But then similarly, if uh, God exists and Jesus rose from the dead are used wholly metaphorically and the atheist fails to grasp the metaphor, then they will indeed fail to contradict or refute what the Christian says. So it seems to me that there's a there's a kind of juice of you on which there's no overlap whatsoever between the atheist understanding and the religious understanding on which it does in fact follow that if that's how religious language is being used in that very different way, metaphorically so, um, then the uh, atheist will fail to contradict and refute what the religious person is asserting. So we get the conclusion that we're after um, on the strong view, the um, juice of view. Uh, but, next slide. Um, I'm sorry, we haven't got to the but yet. This is a bit, bit more unpacking. On, on the strong view, juice of view, then the religious person is committed to a claim, um, but there's no overlap at all between the claim they are committed to and the claim the atheist thinks they are committed to. That's how I'm understanding the strong juice of you. Uh, so next slide. This is just, the criticism is this. This is just completely implausible as an account of how religious language is typically used. Uh, when atheists give arguments against the claims to which they take the religious to be committed, the religious typically respond with counter um, arguments and defences and so on. Now, this makes no sense at all if the religious are actually making no commitment to such claims. Let's have a look at the next slide, because I think it's got an example. Um, yes, it has. OK, so the problem of evil, for example, the religious suggest that there are perhaps unknown God justifying reasons for observed evils, the ter terrible pain and suffering that we witness, for example, perhaps there is some God justifying reason for allowing that pain and suffering. If the religious if the religious meaning of God exists is only metaphorical, then responding in that way to the problem of evil makes as much sense as Romeo's responding to Mary by suggesting that the evidence that Julia's, Juliet is not a massive hot body about which the earth rotates is less than decisive. It, 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 it's it's, it's uh, a completely inappropriate <laughs> response. So the, so I'm just slightly distracted by my dog. The harness is downstairs. Okay. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Let me just say that again because I was distracted by doggy issues. Um, so yeah, so this, the, the problem with the stronger juice of view is it delivers the conclusions that we're after, you know, immunity and no contradiction. Uh, the downside is it's just completely implausible as an account of how religious language is actually used. Religious people actually respond to objections to. Um, um, the claim that God exists, such as the problem of evil, um, by coming up with these kind of moves. Perhaps there is some good justifying reason. That, that makes no sense at all um, if the use of God exists is entirely metaphorical and there's no overlap at all between what the religious person is asserting and what the atheist understands the religious person to be asserting. So I don't find the strong juice of you very plausible either. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So here's a third interpretation of Wittgenstein, um, which I call the atheist minus view. So the, the idea now is that, um, is that the religious meaning is not bigger <laughs> than the atheist meaning or separate from the atheist meaning. It's like a subset of uh, the atheist meaning what the religious person means is something rather less than what the atheist takes the sentence to mean so what might be an example of that um let's go to the next slide um and have a look uh so um suppose that by god uh the theist means an omnipotent, omnibenevolent omni being, and the atheist means an omnipotent and omnibenevolent being that lives on a cloud. What a crude misunderstanding of theism that is from the, the atheist. They actually think God lives on a cloud. 
how ridiculous. Now, if the atheist says there is no God, it's true that they will fail to contradict the theist's claim that there is a God. Uh, in fact, they could both be correct, given what each means by God. I mean, there could be an omnipotent and omnipotent benevolent being so the theist is correct but there ain't no such being living on a cloud so the atheist is correct so what they're claiming both things can be true they fail to contradict each other so the atheist minus view delivers this um conclusion no contradiction uh but let's go on to the next slide um here's another illustration suppose the theist uses god in such a way that god is not a thing um, whereas the atheist thinks of God as an extra thing or something. Uh, this is a popular uh, refrain. Um, you find many religious people saying stuff like this to atheists. So here's the theologian um, Dennis Turner. It's no use supposing that you, the atheist, disagree with me if you say there's no such thing as God, for I got there well before you. So if the if the religious person understands um, God as being not referenced to some additional thing in in addition to the universe and its contents, but it's it's you know we're referring to the ground of all being or something else, not a thing at all. Whereas the atheist understands the word God to refer to uh, a thing, then indeed we're dealing with the atheist minus view. The atheist is attaching more to the concept of God than they should be. They're thinking of God in a thing-like way. That's a mistake. So let's go to the next slide. Um, if the atheist understands um, God as a thing or a something, and the theist doesn't, then when the atheist says there's no God, they will fail to contradict what the theist claims when the theist claims that uh, God exists. So the atheist minus view does actually deliver no contradiction. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So here are the three different interpretations of Wittgenstein, which um, I've set out for you. There's the, there's the, uh, there's, sorry, I've missed out the non-cognitivist one, actually. So there was the non-cognitivist uh, version on which God exists is not used to make a claim at all, and neither is Jesus rose from the dead or there will be a judgment day. These are used purely expressively to emote rather than make claims. But then we moved on to these other views, the simple juice of view on which um, the atheist meaning is a subset of religious meaning, and then the strong juice of view on which the atheist meaning and the religious meaning don't overlap at all. And then finally, we've looked at the atheist minus view on which religious meaning is actually a subset of the atheist meaning. The atheist is attaching too much meaning, making perhaps too concrete their, um, their idea of God. Um, so this is just to set out these differing interpretations. If, so yeah, we can go to the next slide, yep. So here's, um, here are criticisms of the atheist minus view. Um, it's just not plausible for many target sentences. So, what the typical Christian commits to when they say Jesus rose from the dead is just not plausibly less than the atheist understands uh, it to mean. Um, you know, they, they're committed to a historical resurrection. And that is exactly what the atheist uh, understands it, uh, Jesus rose from the dead to mean. So it's just not true that... Um, the atheist is is adding extra bits of meaning that they really shouldn't be here. No, the, the atheist fully understands exactly what it is um, that the theist is claiming. Secondly, um, the atheist minus view fails to guarantee immunity. We said it delivers no contradiction, which it does. It doesn't deliver immunity. If I can show that there's no omnipotent and omnivalent, omnibenevolent being as an atheist, then I do refute what the theist believes, even if I also happen mistakenly to think of God as a thing or living on a cloud. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter that I've added these extra ideas or concepts on. 
I've made a mistake, but it does nothing. And, and, and it may be that I can't, I'm not contradicting the religious person when I say, no, God does not exist. But nevertheless, the argument that I have provided does actually refute what it is that the religious person is committed to. So the atheist minus view does not um, appear to guarantee immunity. So next slide. Um, so our third criticism, uh, given that what the religious believe is on the atheist minus view less than what the atheist initially supposes is, atheists can immediately grasp and contradict what the religious believe by just dropping the commitments they originally thought the belief involved. We just, you know, take a pen and cross out is a thing. And now we're on the same page. It's as simple as that. Um, so um, it seems that it, it, it remains possible and perhaps even quite easy um, for atheists to contradict, contradict, contradict Christians, not just refute the claim, but contradict the claim being made if they if they make these kind of adjustments. Uh, next slide. So, um, so here's my um, conclusion. Oh, time this quite well. Here's my conclusion. Uh, we have three it's three interpretations of Wittgenstein on religious um, meaning. Um, we've seen some inter Glock interprets him as offering a sort of no cognitivist reading of religious utterances. Um, that may deliver no contradiction in immunity, but it's completely implausible as an account of the vast majority of ordinary belief. Secondly, the juice of you uh, fails to deliver no contradiction. Um, the strong juice of you delivers no contradiction, but again is implausible as an account of ordinary religious belief. And then thirdly, the atheist minus view delivers no contradiction, but not immunity, but is implausible for Jesus rose from the dead and allows atheists easily to adjust their position to contradict Christian belief. It's outside, Finn. Okay, um, let's go to the next slide, if there is one. Oh, there is one, thank goodness. Right, in short, uh, none of these Wittgensteinian accounts deliver the conclusion that atheists can't contradict what the religious believe without being implausible as accounts of ordinary belief. For most religious people, i.e. those for whom it really does matter whether the resurrection historically happened, going Wittgensteinian in order to immunize their beliefs against atheist critics uh, is not an option. Um, going Wittgensteinian either strips your belief of any assertion or else fails to deliver uh, immunity and non-contradiction. So, and I think that's the last slide. Is it? Let's find out. Oh, yeah. If you're interested, um, in uh, reading up on this a bit more. It's what I've just presented to you is actually published in a paper. There's an academic paper called Wittgensteinian Accounts of Religious Belief, non cognitivist Juicer and Atheist Minus in European Journal of Philosophy, 2017. But actually, um, there's also an article I wrote on Wittgenstein on religious language or something like that in Eon, A-E-O-N, Eon Online Magazine, um, which again explains everything that I've just um, been through. Um, if you wish to go away and think about this some more and um, unpack it a little bit more. So that's it. That's the presentation. So we can get rid of that now. Um, basically what I've done is I have um, set out why I'm I you know I am an atheist if you guessed that already I am an atheist and um I, I I'm in I've been very interested in these kind of appeals to Wittgenstein to show how actually atheist criticisms of religious belief are somehow off target somehow fail um and having spent some time sort of unpacking the various different interpretations of Wittgenstein I have come to the conclusion that none of this works. And that's that. So I hope that was at least clarificatory, at least if you've not come across Wittgenstein on religious belief before, um, you've, you've got some different, some different ways of reading him now. So any questions? Oh, Who's, who, do you want to Stephen. share? 
I'm, I'm I'm quite happy for it to be for all comers. However, however people want okay. to um, to go about it. I think. Uh, well, thank you. First of all, thank you for stepping so um, logically and systematically through it. I wouldn't expect it not to be logical, of course, but systematically and uh, carefully through it. I I, I want to ask a question, which is, um, assuming this holds, so let's say it holds. Um, who who. It might sound like an obvious question, or to answer this question, but who 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 loses the most? Is it is it religious defenders or atheists? How 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 much of a sort of paper tiger was it? Um, in which case, how much of a um, a sort of um, real victory would it be for 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 your um, for for this um, proposition to hold? Um. It depends. I think it depends on who you're, who you're speaking to. So uh, I, I imagine most, you know, Bible Belt Americans would have not the slightest interest in a Wittgensteinian reading of religious belief. And they are committed to the literal truth of, you know, Genesis. And they've even built Noah's Ark <laughs> in Kentucky. And uh, they've got their creation museum in which they explain that, you um, uh, we really did live in the Garden of Eden with the dinosaurs and so on. So, so for them, obviously, the fact that I have targeted this particular understanding is is, is complete sideshow. <laughs> so it's irrelevant. Um, on the other hand, for um, um, perhaps a much smaller group of rather more sophisticated thinkers, they they, they very often do invoke Wittgenstein, and I think that they do feel that by invoking Wittgenstein, they really are um making some progress in terms of showing how their religious beliefs can resist can have some immunity to these kind of attacks that somehow the atheist critic be it Dawkins or someone else has somehow got the wrong end of the stick and misunderstood what it is that they're attacking and so on um and so for those people um this is this is if I if I'm correct uh, make sure everyone's up but if I'm correct uh this yeah what I've just said is pretty bad news um, uh, however, there are also people in between, I think. In fact, I suspect the vast majority of people are somewhere in between in terms of the audience that I'm more familiar with. Um, there are people who, frankly, do really, when push comes to shove, they do sign up to the, <laughs> the metaphysical claims, the historical resurrection and so on. But um, they've learned that Going Wittgensteinian is a really good get out of jail free card uh, when you're presented with an atheist critic. Uh, at the very least, it provides an extraordinarily useful rhetorical <laughs> device to say, ah, oh, but have you thought about Wittgenstein? And, and of course, immediately, if the atheist is not extremely uh, familiar with the work of Wittgenstein and has spent a lot of time working on this, they're, 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 you know, they're, they're, they're going to immediately be completely out of their depth. So, you know, going Wittgenstein, going Wittgensteinian, uh, a very useful tool, um, even if you are actually um, fairly committed to the truth of um, these claims. Um, and uh, so bad news for them too, then. <laughs> you know, if, if, if I'm right, um, this, this, this isn't going to work. Going Wittgenstein, going Wittgensteinian is not going to work. You're going to have to do something else. Come up with a solution to the evidential problem of evil, uh, for example, <laughs> which, is, which is rather more involved. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, who would like to jump in? I, I've noticed um, Paul Kennedy uh, from your picture. You also have a dog, Paul. Um, does do these uh, Wittgensteinian concepts support the Jungian concept of the transcendent? Stephen. Oh, sorry. I th sorry. I thought you were having <laughs> misunderstood what was going on there. And the dogs. No, going the... <laughs> Just say that again. Sorry. Uh, well, so that, so Paul Kennedy that... in chat. Do these Wittgensteinian I... concepts support the Jungian concept of the transcendent? I have no idea. I'm not sufficiently yet. I've opened my chat now. I rather stupidly left stupidly left it shut. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, it's it's been at least thirty years since I've thought about Jungian concepts of the transcendent, so I'm really I'm really out of my depth there. <laughs> um, 
I'm wondering if I'm Paul, trying to say Paul, if there's if there's, no. a, if there's a reason why I'm, I'm wondering Paul, if there's a reason why you're asking that whether you're making the connection whether you want to jump in or somebody else it would be interesting to hear a bit more about that I would certainly be interested yes. yeah okay so Paul staying quiet um Ken would you like to what yes. this Ken that's oh, Ken. Wow. Yes, you can. Yes, please. Yes, please. I don't mind being slapped down, which I'm sure will happen. Uh, uh, and if I may call you Stephen, I, I don't so. know. I don't know the musings. I only know the uh, uh, the um, oh God. What's the what's the main thing called that I was? I'm not. The, oh. It, we've been looking at Wittgenstein on. Yes, Wittgenstein. I know. I know. But what's and, this? His first book is eighty-two page book. Oh, the Tractatus. Yeah, in the Tractatus, that's the only thing I know at all. Oh, okay. Um, uh, and I have to say, my background is that I'm a weirdo. I'm fifty years in the Twelve Step program, thirty years in Transcendental. Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, and when I read the Tractatus, I'm thrilled to bits because yes. doesn't he say at the end, section six point ten, if you have understood. If you are one of the few who understand what I've been saying, then you will have realized that it's nonsensical and that you have to go beyond it. Then they say you have to climb up the ladder and pull up the ladder after you because there is something more which I'm not prepared to talk about. And then section seven, he says, those things we can't, we don't know, we can't speak about. Yeah. And to me, that immediately suggests a, a, an appreciation of the mystical. Yes. That, yeah. that he is prepared to accept that there is a mystical reality, which to me is quite different from the questions that we've been um, looking at, you know. Yeah. What, what do we talk about the historicity of the Gospels and so on? So am I totally off B, more... No, not at all. No, no, that's that, that's a very good point. And in fact, well, you, you, I'm glad you um, raised that actually, because uh, really at the beginning, what I should have done, but didn't do, uh, and so I'll do it now, is make this distinction between the early philosophy of Wittgenstein and the later philosophy of Wittgenstein. I see. Everything I've said comes from the later period, the later philosophy. Oh. Um, the philosophy of the Tractatus is um, very different, and and again, you know, it's very. There are many different interpretations of uh, what position Wittgenstein held at any, at any at any time, and what the relationship is between the later philosophy and the earlier philosophy. Uh, we don't have time to get into all of that, but you're absolutely right that in the earlier philosophy, he does suggest that there are things that cannot be said but can be shown. And there is, it, it appears that he's gesturing towards something mystical, ineff ineffable, and so on. Um, but that's another whole philosophical position, okay. yeah, which I've which put, to, which I've put, which I've kind of bracketed. Um, we can talk about that stuff too, um, but it wasn't what I was focused on today. Today I was focused on this sort of the different ways um, religious language is used. So if we focus on that, then we will see that actually atheist critics, their, their, their criticisms are off target. I, but, yeah, thank good point. You. I'm, I'm, thank you, Stephen. Yeah. Well, no. Thank you very much. I'll go no, and look at, at your all. article. <laughs> hey, yeah, well, good. Thank, okay. thank you very much, Ken. I, I know that uh, Piers, um, you wanted to ask a question and then we'll come to Sylvia and Alexander. Well, thanks very much. And thanks, Stephen, for your uh, stimulating court talk. Uh, nice to see you, as it were. Yeah, uh, you do. I, I think I, I agree with uh, your criticism of Wittgenstein or the way you present him. And I think if you're a theist, it's, you, you're wise not to go too Wittgensteinian, or at least not too early with it. But I just wonder if you do agree with this possible diagnosis of what is going on with the Juicer view. I mean, mm. I think the critique that you present is convincing. I mean, it's simply not credible to say that atheists and Christians just sort of mean something different by claims like the resurrection occurred. But I suspect what's going on is a kind of equivocation with the word meaning. So a Christian might say, 
well, the meaning of the resurrection in this other sense mm. can't be grasped by somebody who doesn't grasp the meaning of the rest of the picture. For example, the uh, coherence, the, the moral persuasiveness, the spiritual veracity or whatever of the whole Christian worldview. And once you grasp that holistically, you're going to see the meaning in this second sense of the resurrection in a way yeah. that the atheist can't. Now, that's a very interesting view uh, which should yeah. be discussed. And I suspect the way to defend it, actually, though, would not be to go Wittgensteinian in general about meaning. It would be to say something like this. Look, um, we can agree that Christians and atheists should mean the same thing in a narrow sense by Jesus rose from the dead. At least, you know, there's, there's some narrow content that they can, can agree on. But mm. that the best reasons for taking the resurrection seriously will not be, for example, from looking at the biblical evidence or whatever, it's going to be look at a whole lot load of other reasons. So, for example, people like Swinburne will say, yes, Hume is right about the resurrection if we didn't have a prior um, good reason for thinking there's a God or there might be a God and, mm. and a whole variety of other things. And I suspect, I mean, I mean this is not a Christian view because I agree with what you say, but I suspect that's what's really going on when people use this sort of juicer argument, as you call it. I don't know whether you agree with that. No, everything you said, I think everything you said sounds um, sounds correct. Um, so, um, yeah, so in fact, I, I mean, I like, the, like you, I quite like the sort of costing and juice of you. It seems quite plausible to me that there are layers of significance attached to certain religious utterances that um, may be lost on um, some atheist critics. Not all of them, actually, because many atheist critics used to be religious and <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very much immersed in that yeah. whole thing. Um, and you, know, you, you often find that atheists are rather more knowledgeable about, about um, um, religious doctrine than are some believers, particularly in, you know, in, the, in the US. But ne nevertheless, having, having acknowledged that, I think it's true that there probably are dimensions to the significance of an utterance like God exists or Jesus rose from the dead that are largely lost possibly on me and I, I, you know, I just don't get it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy with all of that. Um, it's just that none of that delivers immunity or, 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 no, or, or no contradiction. No, I agree. Um, um, and then, um, but then you're making another point about maybe there's a bigger, I think Alistair McGrath likes to talk about, uh, you know, taking a step back and looking at the big, looking at the big picture as far as Christianity is concerned. And, you know, it just makes more sense of everything um, than does a naturalistic worldview. Mm -hmm. So even if you want to argue about this bit or that bit, or, you know, that, that, that's not why I believe. Um, it's because take, taking a step back and looking at everything it, it, in one go, as it were, I, it, I, it makes more sense to me on the Christian worldview than it does. And, um, you know, that deserves to be taken seriously too, but that's another project. Yeah, for me, we could talk about it, but yeah, be interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Piers. Um, how about Sylvia and Alexander? Hello, uh, thank you for the, the talk. And um, just uh, something stood out on the um, your response to the atheist minus interpretation mm. um, about simply where there's extra. Uh, misunderstandings tacked on, simply crossing them out. Uh, particularly considering how Wittgenstein approaches definitions and is very hesitant about strict definitions in his language games. Um, mm. And I, mean, I did just particularly pick up on um, the example you gave of uh, if you've disproved omnipotent, omnibelevolent being, and mm. also take on thing, simply cross out thing. Um, but if the idea of being a thing and being a being are so closely related and intertwined, and that it's, it seems difficult to simply cross out. Now, maybe possible to dive into and um, um, get a greater understanding and carefully incise and cut away, but simply crossing out didn't seem, um, didn't seem so um, obviously um, easy to do. So could you expand on how you decided that crossing out is always viable? Oh, I didn't say, you know, it's always easy. Um, 
I, it just is, it, it, it could be potentially. Um, um, I think what makes it difficult, just one second, what were you looking for, Trin? Okay, sorry. Uh, so, um, so it's like distraction with dog walking. <laughs> um, remind me of your point again. It was uh, with crossing out that it's uh... okay. Yeah. So the idea, the idea that it's easy to cross something out like is a thing. Um, I agree. From a religious perspective, you might say that's not diff that's not easy at all because. You know, I, I might start off with this childlike conception of God as a as a sort of father figure in the sky, um, but then as my my understanding becomes more sophisticated, I realise I have to start crossing things off. He's no, he's not actually on a cloud, and he's not actually like a physical human being at all. And he's not. And as I start whittling away, he's not even a he's not a thing. Um, as I start sort of whittling away in this way. Um, it can become very difficult to know what it is that you're actually talking about then. And um, you can spend an awful lot of intellectual energy trying to make sense of what's left, if indeed it makes sense at all. Um, and, and that is difficult. That's a very difficult project. Um, and um, the atheist um, is not really interested in <laughs> that project obviously um they're just gonna go look i crossed i've crossed thing off right what more do you want and and the and the theist is going to go well i want you to you know agonize about how there could be a, you know a, a, a creator who's not a thing you know you, you have to really sort of make sense of it. to which the atheist can say do I, why do i have to do that i don't have to do that uh that's your problem as a religious person but you know, I'm not invested in that. I can just cross out thing and Bob's your uncle, my conception uh, matches yours. I mean, admittedly, there's an awful lot of problematic thinking that needs to be to be done. Uh, and you, but you haven't succeeded in doing it yourself, really, have you? I mean, you you admit that all of this stuff is incredibly deep and hard, and it's very difficult to make sense of it. Um, so, yeah, okay, it's difficult, but that doesn't mean that, insofar as I've crossed thing off, we're on the same page. Um, I'm not sure if what I'm saying is in completely is going on being completely fair or I'm actually responding to you, <laughs> uh, what you actually said, but um, hopefully you can do with that what you feel. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Um, I'm trying to see whether there are any more hands up. We had another comment in the chat, which I won't try and read out, Stephen, if you can see it yourself. I did see it, yes. Was the quote from Wittgenstein related to his theory of language game? Is something to do with reality being formed by language? Uh, and it's not possible to understand that reality unless you learn the language. So to expect the language of faith. Yeah, so that's another, that's another um, way of understanding um, Wittgenstein. Uh, yeah, another one. <laughs> so I think it's sometimes called fideism. Um, the idea is that um, language has its home in a particular setting or form of life. Um, so take, you know, let, let's take games literally. <laughs> let, let, let's, let's actually talk about some games. So uh, chess and uh, gin rummy, okay? Now, if you're, if you're playing chess, um, to say checkmate makes perfect sense. The home of that expression checkmate is within the game of chess. And it's only within that game that it really makes sense to say checkmate uh, normally. Uh, ditto Jin Rummy has its own rules, its own methods, uh, its own uh, rules of assessing who's won and who's lost and so on. Um, if somebody in a game of Jin Rummy shouts checkmate, <laughs> people are just gonna scratch their heads and go, what? What are you talking about? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. They're not going to be able to get to grips with with that at all. You're taking a word that has its home in one language game and, and using it in a completely different language game that's not its home at all. Um, and, that, and that just en ends up, you just end up with nonsense. 
So the idea perhaps here in the quotation or in, in, the, um, in the chat is that, you know, religious language has its ho home in a particular form of life. Uh, scientific language has its home in a completely different form of life. And it's a mistake to try and um, judge one by the standards of the other or to think that you can contradict um, what's being said in one by using language that strictly speaking belongs to the other. And so we end up with what Stephen Jay Gould um, called the non-overlapping magisteria. Um, you have these two domains um, and neither can adjudicate so far as the other is concerned. Um, that's another interesting thought. Um, I haven't really addressed that one. Uh, I mean, I could briefly. Um, it's it's not true. I think I think we end up with the same problems. Um, it's it's not true that I mean, when people say, um, I mean, there is a form of life to which talk about witches and demons belongs, um, and it's gone now, um, pretty much. Um, um, but still, we can talk about witches and say there aren't any. <laughs> they don't exist. And it's true that what we, we won't, you know, we're not immersed in the form of life to which that vocabulary originally belonged. Um, but that is not an obstacle to our contradicting those who claim that witches were real um, and refuting their beliefs. And I think the same is true of something like, you know, Jesus rose from the dead. God exists, there is the potential to um, refute these claims, even if, as a matter of fact, the person offering the refutation isn't fully immersed in the in the relevant language game. There's sufficient overlap there for a refutation to take place. But um, that's a very quick answer. This is a big, I admit, this is a big topic and I'm not really doing it justice. Good. Okay, Stephen, thank you very much. Um, I'm aware of the time. We're just slightly